You're listening to the Brandon Assembly Podcast. Brandon Assembly exists to share the authentic Jesus Christ, equip believers to experience relevant faith, and to celebrate the grace of God without limits. We invite you to check out our website at www.brandonag.org where you can find out more information about our church. Hey, good morning, Brandon Assembly. How's everybody doing? Welcome, welcome. That was so weak right there. Let's try that again. Good morning, Brandon Assembly. How's everybody doing? Yay! Uh, If you're new to our church, welcome to the 8 o'clock worship experience. My name is Brent. I'm your lead pastor, and I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, This morning is a little bit unusual. We get to do something that's a little bit unusual. We have a special announcement for you. And uh, so we're we're flip-flopping the order of service quite a bit. I'm going to go straight into uh, the message right now. Um, And uh, so we're flip-flopping a little bit. Because um, um, are you ready to hear the big announcement? We've been talking about this for a week. Uh, I keep posting it out there. Are, are you ready for this? You might need to turn this down a little bit, Andre. It sounds like to me. Um, uh, are you ready to hear this? This because that didn't sound very convincing a second ago. Let me try that again. Are you ready to hear the big announcement? Yeah. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the biggest things our church has ever done. I, I really believe this is amazing, a beautiful thing. In fact, in my opinion, and I'll explain why in a few moments, it's bigger uh, than than the new campus that we're building. Um, and somebody said, well, that has to be pretty big. Well, my opinion it is. Some people might disagree, but in my opinion, it is. Uh, uh, let me begin to um, take you back in history. I think we have PowerPoint slides for all this. Uh, take you back in history. Four years ago, almost to the month, in October of 2011, uh, I ministered in Nepal. And many of you are aware of that because I tell a lot of stories from Nepal. It's, of all the missions trips and things that I've been on over the years, it's one of the most life-changing trips I've ever been on. Uh, because it is a third world country. It is radically different than what we're used to inside of the United States and, and feels radically different than what we're used to inside of the United States. And located between India and China is this little nation of Nepal, uh, that gets its resources almost entirely from, uh, India. Uh, uh, in fact, it's my understanding. I don't even think China looks at it as a nation. Um, it's this little country is kind of wedged in between massive countries. And so all of their resources, all of their identity, everything comes from these other countries. And uh, so to, to say that they are third world, um, to say that they are impoverished is, is really an understatement. Some of the things I saw there were, were, were genuinely life-changing. And I know we use that word a lot, but they really were. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, a few months ago, um, what was it, May of this year, I believe. Sorry, April of this year and a few in May. Uh, there were severe earthquakes that happened in Nepal. You remember that on the news? Yeah. Severe earthquakes happened in Nepal a few months ago, and it devastated the country of Nepal, claiming more than 9,000 lives with over 23,000 wounded. Uh, it was a big deal. Their infrastructure was not solid as it was. Then you throw in earthquakes on top of this. It was a big deal. Um, this is a, a Hindu society for the most part. Christianity is a very small segment of society. They're very anti-Christian in most ways. Uh, it's not that they're... Just not Christian, they are actually anti-Christian as we're running into uh, in different areas um, even right now. Um, of all those who were affected by these earthquakes and what's going on, um, and certainly there were many affected, but some of the greatest and most affected were the children. Uh, specifically the girls, uh, really more than just saying the children, because the boys a lot of times can kind of fend for themselves a little bit. Boys are in that society are looked at in a higher standard than girls are. Uh, women are not treated very well as the the culture of most cultures that are not Christian. Women are not treated very well. Little girls are not treated very well. Uh, in fact, I think it's about three quarters of girls under the age of 16 are completely illiterate because they, they don't go to school. They don't get to go to school. Uh, girls are, are trafficked in and out of the country uh, uh, a lot uh, with human trafficking and things that go on with that. So let me just give you a few statistics about what's going on in Nepal. I want you to get this. Nearly two million children are affected by the current earthquake in Nepal. Two million children, which has left 320,000 children homeless. 320,000 children have been left homeless. Um, the need for orphanages in Nepal was great uh, before this, but now after this, it's even greater. After this um, um, struggle, it's even it's even more than it ever has been before. Uh, 
Nepal has the number one uh, child disappearance rate in the world. The number one child disappearance rate in the world. What's happening to these kids? Well, several things can be happening to these kids. But one of them that is a severe thing, that, that I mean all of them are severe, don't get me wrong. But one of them that is in tune with our heart as a church is that many of these little girls have been snatched up from the traffic for sexual exploitation. Uh, this is a, a major, major problem. In fact, some of the orphanages you've heard, and we'll talk more about this in another week, but some of the orphanages you've heard of have actually bought girls out of human trafficking. They bought them back. They redeemed them. I don't know what else is closer to the gospel than that. And so, so, so human trafficking is a, is a major point of exploitation there in the country and stealing children away. Uh, 34% of Nepali children are involved in some type of child labor ranging from agricultural work to commercial sexual exploitation. Um, by the way, uh, all the pictures that I show and all the pictures that are on this are actually pictures I took while I was there. This is a young girl. If I had to guess, I'd say she's around 11 years old. And uh, we were trekking as we did while I was there the whole time, walking up and down the side of mountains. And while we're trekking uh, in these mountains, uh, uh, this little girl was, was walking back with this giant bundle of whatever that is exactly, some type of hay and straw and, and, and such, uh, taking it back to her village. She's probably about 11 years old. About uh, it is heartbreaking. It is a sad story when uh, most countries you go to, even poor countries, and many of you have been on mission trips with me before, where we can go to the poorest Latin American countries here locally. And, and even in those countries, when you work with the children, they're still happy. They're giving away candy. They're excited. They're running around. They're playing soccer. They're playing whatever baseball thing on the country. And, and they're still happy. They're still smiling. They're still, they're, they're still excited about life because they're children and you're supposed to be when you're a child, right? And uh, in Nepal, it wasn't that way. In fact, you'll see as these pictures carry on that there's some kids who are smiling. There's other kids that just look bland and upset. And, and because it is a hard life and for children as well, it is very, very difficult. Um, the 34% are, are child laborers. At least 40,000 children are what's called bonded laborers, or you might recognize the term indentured servants. Uh, because of their parents having debt, they get indebted to somebody, and now they work for them basically as indentured servants or slaves. What's happened after the earthquake is even worse, because after the earthquakes have happened, now you have many, many children's parents who have passed away. So now the parents cannot even do the work anymore, so now the child becomes a slave. To the master who, who uses them as indentured servants. At least 40,000. There's probably less than that that will be in Buck Stadium if they're playing it uh, this afternoon. It is a, a huge problem. Girls account for the highest number of working children in Nepal, even more so than boys, uh, which is directly related to the increased amount of sexual trafficking that's going on uh, from India and into the Middle East and stuff. Since the earthquake have, since the earthquakes have taken the lives of thousands of caretakers, many children are less vulnerable, have no choice but to beg on the streets to provide for themselves or their families. It is a destitute thing there. I'm not just saying it, I've experienced it, I've seen it. And then with what's going on again now, it's even worse. In fact, right now, they're so dependent on India and China, mainly India. Uh, India has some sort of embargo, oil embargo thing going on right now, and it's even worse right now. 24,000 children under the age of five die in Nepal each year. I'm sorry, each year. Sorry, each year. With an infant mortality rate of 40 deaths per 1,000 live births. So 40 deaths for every 1,000 live births are going to die in the first five years of their life. So, so I go to Nepal and I'm looking at all this and, and I'm getting frustrated and I'm seeing what's going on. And this is four years ago, mind you. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing what's going on. I'm frustrated by what I see. It's difficult. Some of the stories, some of the stories are amazing. Some of them are just, just horrible. Uh, uh, the missionary that I worked with while I was there, his name is Raju. He's not really a missionary. He's a local pastor, but he's working with us while we were there. His wife gave birth to stuff by cell phone light in the hospital, uh, because the power goes on and off all the time. And, uh, she was actually in the hallway of the hospital giving birth, not in a room. In the hallway of the hospital, the electricity goes out in the hospital, which is common, and they don't think anything of it. I'm going like, really? They're like, oh, this is, this is normal. And they all turn their cell phones on, and she gave birth via cell phone light in the hallway of the hospital. This is the world that, that I'm talking about. It's just it's, it's, it's amazing to us. And so I come back, and I'm thinking to myself, man, somebody should do something about this. 
And as you well know, anytime we say somebody should do something about this, usually that means we should do something about this, you should do something about this. God's giving you a burden for a reason. And so, so I came back and I had this vision. Now, this is four years ago. I had this vision. I, I thought, there's, there's a few of these things that I still have in my head, but, but this was one of them. And I thought, what, what would it be like? Like, like, what if we could do something as Brandon Assembly God? What if we could, like, you got to understand, Nepal is the other side of the world. Literally, if you take a globe with your finger on, on Florida and just stick your finger on the opposite side, you're going to hit really close to Nepal. You might actually hit on it, or you might be India or right there, but you're right there. You, it is literally the other side of the other side of the world. And when you go there, you actually fly forward in time. Uh, I had the shortest birthday of my life that year. I got gypped. I got like half a birthday that year. I got there and I realized it was my birthday as soon as I got there, and the sun was already going down. I'm like, this is plain, not fair. <laughs> so I had this idea. I thought, what if we could do something about this? And, and we had talked as a staff. We had talked different times over and over over the last few years. I thought, what if, what if we could start an orphanage in Nepal? Because we don't really have a whole lot of assembly God missionaries there. I think we have two in the whole country. Um, but what if what if we could start an orphanage in Nepal? Now you got to understand that's a ridiculous statement because our church is way too small for this. Um, uh, we're, we're larger than the average American church, but but in in the course of starting things like this by ourselves, uh, our church is just way too small for something like that to happen. And so I started to dream. Has anybody ever dreamed before? It's really cool when dreams become reality. Just ask Walt Disney. Isn't it cool when dreams become reality? So, after four years of pondering this, of thinking about this, of talking to people in Nepal, of talking to the missionaries that go back and forth, of talking to our people that are on the ground there, Raju and such, after four years of thinking, how in the world could we do this? Four years, to be honest, of talking to other pastors about it and then rolling their eyes at me, which I get a lot because I'm young and naive, and they're going, ah, yeah, that's, that's a great dream, pastor. Four years of all of this, let me introduce you Elsa's House of Hope. <laughs> we, thought, we thought long and hard about what we could do about this problem. And uh, we went back and forth with all kinds of ideas, how to name it, what we were going to do with this orphanage, if this orphanage could ever get off the ground, what it would look like. And uh, hang on, is it already uh, it's ahead of Um. Uh, uh, and so we started looking around our church and we want to honor people. It's a part of our culture. We want to honor those uh, who have gone before us in many ways. And, and, uh, and Elsa is one of those, as you all know, especially in this 8 o'clock service. He's been coming to this church since God was a child. And, uh, and virtually that entire time, literally until just a few years ago, even after I came to the church, which she's got to be in her 90s at that point, uh, uh, literally she was still bringing teenagers with her to church every Wednesday night. I'm like, I don't want to bring teenagers to church with me. And I'm young. Anyway, um, but she's always had a heart for our kids. She's always had a heart for that. And so I want to introduce you to Elsa's House of Hope. This plaque is literally going to be there because in January of next year, this next January, a couple months from now, we are going to be supporting 10 little girls in our own Brandon Assembly of God's orphanage called Elsa's House of Hope. Isn't that awesome? We get to be fathers to the fatherless and mothers to the motherless. We are literally going to feed them, house them, clothe them, educate them, pay for their medical expenses. This is our orphanage. We are completely supporting them. We are completely being mothers to the motherless and fathers to the fatherless. Every need that these girls are going to have, we are going to be meeting that need. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that incredible? <laughs> So, so let me introduce you to a couple of the leaders uh, who are involved in this. Uh, first of all, this next slide right here is, uh, is uh, Mina and Santa. These are going to be the house moms. These are going to be the ones on the ground who are actually working in the home. Uh, both of these have gone through a, a schooling to know how to work inside of an orphanage. Both of them are widows. Uh, both of their husbands have passed away. Uh, Mina is 44 years old. Santa is 38 years old. They are both strong Christians, solid Christians. They have been hand-selected by our person on the ground there. And uh, these are going to be the two house moms. Sorry, there's not the best picture, but you can, you can kind of get an idea. I had to zoom in on a picture that had a bunch of other folks in it as well. Because there wasn't just a picture of, of the two of them. 
uh, let me introduce you to uh, Raju. Uh, Raju, and if I'm saying this correctly, Guiano. Uh, uh, Garum, this is our, uh, our, our, our people on the ground who are going to be administrating this. Uh, this was my guide when I was there. He's an Assembly of God pastor. He's been to Assembly of God uh, school there, the Bible school. He's our Assembly of God pastor on the ground. And uh, he is the one that was my guide while I was there. And uh, this is Raju and Diana. But I, I thought we might be able to do a little bit better than that. How many of you would like to meet them this morning? Yeah? Yeah? Come on up. Come on. <coughs> We're going to do this as quickly as possible. But via Skype, even though they are now, and I messed up my timing, so poor Raju, sorry. Um, I need to come over here where he can see me. Uh, uh, via Skype, we are going to have the opportunity to talk to Raju, even though they are now 11 hours ahead of us. Like, it is it is getting evening there already. Uh, it's a rap rapidly different world. Let's see. Can you see me? Can you hear me, Raju? <laughs> We need to unmute the channel that says not mute the channel on the right that uh, Brad plays the thing with the phone. Unmute that. Thing. There you go. Oh, y'all see Rod on the screen. Can you hear me? I'm going to use my assistant Tony here to help me. The purple mic. All right, let's try it. Can you hear me now? Yes, Pastor Brad. Can you all hear him? This is the purple mic, Andre. You can do that. All right, we got him on the big screen. This is Raju. Everybody say hi, Raju. <laughs> so excited that you're you're with us. Do you want to say anything to our church? Let me. I've already introduced you, so you can just kind of say hi to our church. Sure. Hello, Pastor Brad and uh, Brandon, Assembly of God Church. This is Pastor Raju Gurum from Pokhara, Nepal. And this morning is my privilege and joy to speak with you all. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, can you quickly explain the need for an orphanage in Nepal and what's going on there with the need? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, if we look just uh, last couple of years, we have... Uh, whole nation was very, uh, so many different tragedies, long civil wars, uh, by which many uh, kids were, uh, they lost their parents, then we have always like politically unstable, and poverty number one reason here, and recently six months ago, a big tragedy earthquake hit so badly, where more than 500,000 houses destroy, more than like 200,000 kids are like, they lost their parents, so, so much of needs here and um, poverty is number one because of that, you know, many kids are in the street, uh, especially the girls in very young age, they are, they are, they are kidnapped, they are sold and just uh, in India itself, in our neighbor, more than 500,000 girls are in the uh, prostitutions. So that's where like uh, kids are in desperate needs to someone go and help them. And um, it's a big need here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to you guys, like like on the ground in Nepal, with what you're facing? What does it mean to you guys when a church like us partners with you to do something like this? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's a, like really, really great blessings because of uh, God grace. Because we are hit ground when we see all those pay uh, needs and suffering. We really want to help as much as we can, but because many of these financial reasons, so many other we can't help. So it's a, like a great blessing. Some of us like and stand with us and help us the many kids. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um. Uh. Do Do you have? Uh. I know we went back and forth with this this morning because of the time change. Are any of the kids there right now? Yeah, I have a uh, boys. Apparently, all the girls, uh, they went with my wife for the yeah. two days. Okay. I have three boys now. <laughs> Introduce um, us to the three boys. <laughs> that is Sudin. When he came, he was only 18 months. So, he was, he was three. His mom was like, oh, and someone raped her. She doesn't know. So, some found and... 
referred to as Tamil. He is also uh, when he came here, he was 18 months. And Samuel is from very rural area. To he need to walk, whatever bring him ten days to get in city from where they can catch the bus. The ride two days in the bus, so it's four days to reach in his village, very rural area. So I have another boy also, uh, Raja. <laughs> He's also in rural area, so <laughs> three boys now with me. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to Skype with you again in a couple of weeks, as you know. And uh, But I just wanted to introduce you to the church. I'll explain in a moment where all the other kids are once you're off, off the air. But uh, uh, thank you for what you do on the ground. And we're really, really excited to be partnering with you and uh, helping to start this orphanage. So, so thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, right, thank you so much. Um, I want to I wanna just to know, like, this is a, like, great, great, awesome work. As a team together we are doing we are going to change many kids' life and it's a great blessings. Amen. Amen. All right, let me teach you something, church. Wait, wait, let me teach you. In Nepal, they they um they say jimacy, which is a, a Christian term uh, in Nepal. In fact, only, as I understand it, help me if I'm wrong, uh, Raju, but basically only the Christians say this to each other. It means like God bless you or something like that. It's how they greet each other. It's also how they end. And they put their hands together like this and they say jimacy. So, jimacy. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, Raju. Thank you. <laughs> so, is anybody excited yet? Is this cool? Raju is a great man of God on the ground there. Uh, let me explain to you quickly. Uh, right now, it's actually a holiday there. I'm not sure which one. It might be Diwali because when I was there in October. Four years ago, the wallet might be the wallet, uh, but his wife has actually taken all of the girls and they're gone somewhere because it's a holiday. And then there's a few kids that they have relatives uh, that, that take them during the holidays only. So you know they might have an aunt, uncle here or there. So during holidays they go there, then they come back to the so, uh, But that's where they're all at. You're going to get to see all the others in another another worship experience. Um, so at least the next question: How are we going to accomplish this? What are we? How are we going to pull this off? How are we going to do it? Uh, I've been working through this for a long time, and this is what I feel the Lord has led us to do, and I am really excited about it. We are going to accomplish it first and foremost by everybody doing their part. Everybody doing their part. Uh, we are all going to get together on the Thanksgiving service this year, uh, the 22nd of November, which is uh, four weeks, four Sundays from now, depending on how you're counting them. Today's the first. And uh, on that Sunday, I am challenging us to give a one-day offering to meet the needs of this orphanage for the remainder of the year. Uh, we're going to be able to support the orphanage for around $1,000 to $1,200 a month uh, uh, for all of these kids, paying for all of their food, their housing, the people that watch over them, paying their salaries, all of those things, uh, which is remarkably cheap. And I'm believing that we're going to be able to do that in a one-time offering. Uh, also, by the way, the reason why we're only having girls, at least to start, is for a couple reasons. One, because it's more... The need is greater for females. Uh, the need is greater. Uh, secondly, because it's cheaper for us, because anytime now you put boys and girls into the mix, now you need male and female workers, and everything kind of changes. Uh, so secondly, because of that, and thirdly, because of our, our, our belief in human trafficking and how we look at that as missions and, and, and belief in how we should be doing something to stop that. And while that also happens with little boys, it's far more common with the little girls than the little boys. And so on the 22nd of this month, we are going to take an offering, and we are believing uh, for a one-time, this first offering, for the goal to be $30,000. Um, say, that sounds like a whole lot of money. It is. Uh, but we can do this together. We've actually done this before. And if everybody does their part, we can pull this off. Uh, if you're doing the math in your head and you're saying, where's the extra cost coming? Well, right now, we have to send money over right even even next this week, like tomorrow. Uh, we'll be sending uh, money over because we have to start up everything. you got startup costs that are associated with the beginning. Uh, for instance, we've got to buy bunk beds for all these girls. Uh, we got to buy pillows, sheets, blankets, mattresses, uh, sofa set. we got to buy a teat couch and a TV, or a TV and a VCR, I should say, or a DVD player. <laughs> Who has a VCR anymore? Uh, uh, but we got to buy all those things that if, like, if you moved into an apartment for the first time and it's unfurnished and has nothing, we can't send these girls into an unfurnished apartment. we got all these startup costs that arrive. On top of that, you got some normal stuff like the school supplies that are coming up and school uniforms that are some normal startup costs. Uh, that will be passed down generationally to the students. 
uh, but also uh, uh, you got the, the startup costs that arise from that. There's a there's a heater and just little things uh, that we have to start with. So there's a significant amount of startup costs that we have to start with. On top of that, we're also going to be sending somebody over at least once a year to go see it, to visit it, to shoot video, to shoot testimonies, to take pictures and bring it back to us so we can see it. And all of that is associated with it. So we are believing for at least $30,000 in this offering. That's our goal. Uh, if we have less than that, we're still moving forward. If we have more than that, we're still moving forward. We're believing that as the church grows in the future, um, uh, we are believing strongly that this orphanage is also going to grow. Maybe we go from 10 girls to 15 girls to 20 girls or what have you. But as God continues to bless our church, that we're going to continue to be a blessing around the world. And this is one of those, those areas. Uh, somebody also might say, um, well, why are we giving all this money away when we're in the middle of starting a new campus and all that right now? The reason for that is simply this. You can't outgive God. And I know we say it all the time. And last week we started this Blessed Life series where we were talking about giving. But it is true. You cannot outgive God. That's a core value of who we are as a church, core value of me. If you are giving in the way God desires you to give, which doesn't mean you just throw money around, but when God puts something on your heart, especially when it's been four years in the mixing pot and mixing it around and thinking on it and trying to figure it out, uh, I don't believe we can outgive God. And I believe the way that God grows the finances of the church to do the things that we want to do here is by giving out there. Amen? Amen. So we're all going to give together on November the 22nd. That's our, that's our Thanksgiving service under the tent. We're going to have something special provided for you that day as well as well as every week leading up to it. Uh, we are asking you to partner with us to change lives in the effect of, it's about $100 per child per month. Now, that's a, it varies, and there's all kinds of things because we're talking about children, and if you have any children, you know that one month they're cheap, and one month they're expensive, and one month they break an arm, and one month they need this medication. We know all that, right, because it varies. But roughly around $100 a month, that's a round figure that we can use uh, to support the children in this orphanage. And... Uh, so we are challenging you to give in the amounts of $100. So you can support a child for one month for $100. You can support a child for six months at $600 or a year at $1,200. But we want to challenge you and ask you to both pray and to plan. Pray and to plan. Um, uh, 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 first of all, you, you pray about it. You ask the Lord what he wants you to give, not what you just necessarily want to give, but God, how much do you want me to give? And secondly, you plan it out. That's why we're giving you four weeks notice right now. You plan out your giving. I'm going to say something strong, and I hope you receive this well. If you don't have to plan out your giving, if it doesn't have to be budgeted into your life, you're not giving enough. This is called a sacrificial gift. If you can just throw it in like it's a tip, that's not what we're talking about here. And certainly God will use that, but, but we are expecting people to plan out their giving to give a significant amount for this. Uh, because we are going to be rescuing children around the world. Amen? Um, uh, it's quite possible, and I'll get into this in further weeks, we're going to be buying some kids, from some girls from human trafficking. Um, uh, we're going to do everything we can to make a difference in their lives. Amen? Amen. Uh, some of you can sponsor a girl for a year, some a month, some a week, but everybody can do something, and by everybody doing something, we're going to get this orphanage off the ground. So this leads to the next question. Why is this bigger than our new campus, at least to me? Because I know some of you are like, well, I know this is big, but why is it bigger? Uh, and let me give you three reasons why it's bigger. The first one is this, because we are doing something unprecedented for a church our size. Uh, this is beautiful. It is unprecedented. This is one of those things that other pastors roll their eyes at me about. Uh, they get excited, but at the same time, they're like, how in the world are you pulling that off? Uh, 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 it's because of our connections there. It's because of what God's doing. It is unprecedented. It is really a beautiful thing. But that's the least most important. The second thing. Uh, is because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. More blessed to give than it is to receive. So, so let me tell you what's going to happen through this. When we get a new campus, it's really all about us and our needs. Right? Um, it, it gives us a bigger platform to minister. It gives us, and it's all about us and me and my, and that's beautiful and that's wonderful, but it is always more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I personally believe it's so much of a greater blessing as we give to these little girls who probably will never see your face. Now, we're going to do some stuff where we write back and forth and our children's ministry is going to to them and we got all these kind of things in our head. But, but ultimately, you're probably never going to know them personally other than see them on video and pictures. You're probably never going to know them. But it is such a beautiful thing when the church says, I don't get anything out of this relationship. I just want to bless somebody else. Because in the bigger picture... 
other than some pats on the back and a feeling of, I did something good, you're not going to get anything out of this relationship. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. I think that is the way God is it to be. And then the third reason is this, because we are rescuing lives. I don't know if I can emphasize this enough. You are literally saving lives. I don't mean figuratively. I mean literally. There is a good chance, and we'll again talk about this as the weeks go on, we are going to buy girls out of human sexual trafficking. You are literally saving lives. These girls will never be the same. On top of that, you got the spiritual culture of Hindu. And we're rescuing them into a Christian orphanage where they're going to hear about God and learn about Jesus Christ. And all of these things are going to happen, but you are literally rescuing lives. Sometimes we say things like this and we wonder, like, what does my life matter? Have I made a difference? Have I done anything that's going to count? I know many people, as you, if you get a little bit older in life, you start asking yourself this question, have I made a difference? This is one of those ways that you make a difference. And if you don't believe it, you'll be able to ask these girls that you make a difference. You are literally rescuing them. This is a move of God. This is a move. So that's one of the reasons, that's, that's the reason why I personally believe this is bigger than our new campus. I am more excited about this than I am my new campus. Are you with me? Hopefully I'm not the only one, but, but I understand. I might not be. Uh, we are giving hope to the hopeless. Our, our key scripture, which is on the plaque, and you're welcome to look at it after the service, but our key scripture is Psalm chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. It says this, You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cries. Defending the fatherless and the oppressed. I'm talking about the orphans of Nicole. In order that man who is, of, uh, who is of the earth may terrify no more. No longer we don't have to be terrified anymore. At least with a few of these girls, at least we can do something because of Elsa's power. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Amen, amen, amen. So I invite you to pray and plan. We're going to talk about this every week. We're going to have at least one other Skype with Raju. We're going to have some videos and things that I'm connecting back and forth with them. You're going to hear about this every week as we go in a little bit more depth of what we're doing. But I hope this was worth all the excitement of talking about the big announcement. Was that worth it? If it wasn't worth it, you need to get saved. Uh, <laughs> and no, Ada's is not pregnant. Like so many people were hinting, oh, you're announcing that Ada's is pregnant. No, she's not pregnant. Anyway. But uh, uh, also, do me a favor. We got four more services today. So until after 7 p.m. this evening, don't, don't. Right on social media. Don't talk about this. After that, you can talk about it all you want. You should talk about it. You should be excited about it. But but let everybody else hear it from me. That way we get to, to build the excitement. Amen. Now I have about about 12 minutes to do the actual message this morning. I knew that was going to happen. I, I know that's how it works. But this was important, and I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time to talk about the Nepali orphanage. So, hey, hey, um, have you ever noticed that what is first is special? Like, like we got some babies in the room, dry room. Like, like, first steps are special, right? Like, parents freak out over first steps. First steps, the parents act like it's the greatest thing in the world. This kid's gonna be walking the rest of their life. I still take steps. My dad's in the room. He doesn't get excited anymore. He's not like, look at my boy walking on that stage. He doesn't do that. Because it's only the first steps that are important, right? It's the first words that are important. I think, I think you have the book. It's the first words that are important, right? Like, 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 nobody gets excited that I'm still talking now. You're like, I wish you would stop talking so much sometimes. But nobody gets excited because it's the first word when you're a baby and they speak that first mama or dada or oop or whatever it is. Um, you even make up words sometimes. I've seen parents that are like, he said mama. You're like, no, he didn't. He said her. <laughs> but, but they want to hear it so bad. They're desperate for hearing it. The first are important. You got your first lady. You got the first president of the United States. You got the first pick. You got... You remember your first car. You remember all these things that are so, so, so important. First is important. In fact, last Sunday, there was a really cool first that happened uh, uh, in, in, in NFL. Uh, in fact, if you got that video, Bill, go ahead and hit that video. Watch this, and then I'll explain it. It's only like 15 seconds. Watch this, and then I'll explain it. Well, Jameis Winston played maybe his best game as a pro today. He was dialed in. And he's not done. Jameis already up 10 nothing. Finds Dante Dante Die. You want to sing it? Oh, no, 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 no. 
this guy, this guy's Dante Die. All right, they they said his name wrong. Uh, you got to feel a little bad because they said his name wrong. But this guy is living on cloud nine. You know why? Because it was not only his first NFL catch, it was his first NFL catch, and it was a touchdown at the same time. Don't you know he's taking that ball home with him? I mean, your first catch ever. What makes it even better is this kid comes from a Division three school called Heidelberg. In other words, a really small school where most people never have a chance to go to the NFL. If you hear his whole story, when he was a senior in high school, he blew out his knee, and none of the big schools would give him a scholarship. So he goes to a little school, never thinking he'd ever even get a chance to make it to the NFL. Makes it to the NFL, makes it end up on the Bucks practice squad, and then he ends up making the active roster, realizing I'm never actually going to play in the game. Two Bucks receivers get hurt. Heidelberg, Heidelberg, a uh, die comes into the game, receives his first catch ever in the NFL, and catches a touchdown. Now that's an impressive first, right? I mean, that, that, I mean, what is first is special, especially when it's something like that. And you thought I'd never even make it. And then you have that ball and you think I'm putting that on myself for the rest of my life. So with that being said, with what's first is what's special being said, I want to ask you this question. Who is first in your life? Who is first? Now, now I know we always say that, like God is first in my life. But, but what I want to talk about for the few, next few moments is this. You're going to see who's first in your life by your checkbook or your giving statement or your, your, your online statement. Nowadays, nobody really uses checkbooks, but in this 8 o'clock service, there's a few of you who probably do, but you're going to see who's first by looking at your finances because every time, every time you get a paycheck, you have an opportunity to say who's first in your life. Every time you receive income from some place, you have an opportunity to worship somebody. Some of us worship Tico. Some of us worship our car. Some of us worship a restaurant. But God says, no, no, I, I should be first. And that is the principle of the time. Now, Proverbs chapter number three, verse nine through ten says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the last fruits of your crops. Well, that's not what it says. With the First fruits of all of your first fruits, the beginning portion, the first portion, the first fruits of all of your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I love this verse. In fact, oftentimes we quote Malachi when we talk about tithing, but there's all kinds of verses about tithing because, and this is your first point, tithing is biblical. Tithing is biblical. We through it see it throughout the Bible. Now, you can write in hand notes if you want to. I don't have time to dig in this as much as I'd like to. Last week, I told you when I started the series about my giving testimony and how I read a little 12, 15-page book that said tithing was just an Old Testament principle. Uh, the more I studied it, the more I read beyond a 12 to 15-page pamphlet, uh, and the more I studied it, you start to realize that tithing is a principle throughout the Bible. In fact, it predates the law. Uh, you see it in Malachi chapter, chapter 3. That's the most a common tithing verse that you always read that says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that your barns may be, that, my, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see that I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing on you, that there will not be room enough to store it. Uh, we see it there, but really you see it throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So let me just give you some thoughts quickly. First of all, tithing predates the law. Some buddies might say, well, tithing is the law only. Tithing actually started before the law was ever given. You can go all the way to, to Genesis chapter 14, and that is the first mention of the tithe, and that predates the law where it talks about King Melchizedek. It's literally 500 years before the law. You can go to Genesis chapter 28 where they talk about the, the tithe, and it's 400 years before the law was ever given there, and it's talking about the tithe. Uh, tithing was in the law. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Uh, you see that it was part of the law, but you can go beyond that and see that Jesus talked about tithing. In Matthew chapter 23, he said it was good that you're tithing. That is a good thing, he said in Matthew chapter chapter 23. Uh, you can go into the New Testament teachings in Hebrews chapter 7, and, and you will see once again where he reports back to Melchizedek and mentions that all over again, uh, that tithing is a good thing and we should be tithing. So it's not law. It actually goes before the law. It is the law. comes after the law. Jesus talked about it, and it's in the New Testament too. There is no way around it. Now, you could say... And I've heard some people make this argument that we are under grace now. We are not under the law. Therefore, we don't have to tithe. I think you might be able to make an argument for that. But the only possible way to make an argument for that is if you're actually giving more than the tithe. 
So if your argument is, I don't have to tithe, I'm, under, I'm not underneath the law, I'm underneath grace, I can give whatever I want to. Well, you might be able to make that argument, but the only way you can make that argument is to give more because grace always does more than the, what the law requires. Remember Jesus said things like, if, like, like, like you know, if you've ever looked at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery because grace is higher <laughs> than, than the law was. Law said don't look at a woman lustfully uh, or, or don't, don't commit adultery. Jesus said if you've ever looked at her lustfully, you've already committed adultery. Grace is higher than the law is. And so we see it throughout the Bible. And the only proper argument for not tithing that you could make is actually if you're giving more. The second thing I want to give you, and by the way, this is all part of the Blessed Life series. It's all stolen from Robert Morris. I'm not, uh, I fully, I know what I'm doing. I'm stealing from Robert Morris for all of this. We have Blessed Life books. I forgot to bring them out here. In fact, Kyle, if you can grab them out of my office and bring them up here. If you didn't get one last week, make sure you get them today. We did run out of them. We want to give them away. Uh, but the second thing I want to mention is this. Tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. Every time you receive uh, uh, finances of some sort, every time you get a paycheck, uh, every time that happens and you get an increase or whatever it looks like, it is a test to see will you put God first. Is he really first in your life or is he just a part of your life? Because what is first is special. First things are always special. And tithing is a test. And every week when we receive uh, uh, our paycheck or we receive wherever your money comes from, it is a test to see are you going to put God first. This is why, at least in my life, and this started from Robert Morris's teaching years ago. At least in my life, I have it set so that the first thing that comes out of my account to the best of my ability is my tithe. It's actually my missions and tithe to do two different places because I have to tithe to the Assemblies of God and I also do it to our church as well. So, so, so I have multiple areas and it all comes out because we get paid on Thursday. It all comes out every Thursday because of PayPal. You can set it up that way to where it comes out. That, I think it's whatever day you start it has to come out that day. You can set it to come out weekly. So I purposely started on Thursdays so that to the best of my ability, the first thing that comes out of my account every week is the tithe. So somebody might say, like, like if I had uh, 10, uh, $10 bills or 10 $1 bills, and you say, which one is the tithe? That's a good question, right? Because the tithe is 10% of your gross income. So if you've got $10, the tithe is how much? $1, just making sure you're paying attention. The tithe is $1 if you've got $10. But which one of those dollars is the tithe? The first one. The first one is the tithe. That's why sometimes people say things like, I can't afford a tithe. If you understand tithing and you understand it's the first one, then you can never actually say that statement because it's always the first one that comes out and you live off the other nine or the other 90%. That is the way God expects it. And uh, this is a kingdom principle, by the way. As you've heard me talk about the kingdom of God many times, Whatever you put into the kingdom of God, whatever you surrender to the kingdom of God, gets blessed. This is why last week I talked about if you surrender your finances to the kingdom of God, if you say, God, truly and genuinely, this is all yours. I'm listening to your voice. I want to give what you've given me. If you truly do that, God blesses it. And the tithe is a weekly time that you get to say, God, you are first. I bless, I, I give, I return this, as I should say. I return this back to you. And in so doing, you're making it part of the kingdom because it's a kingdom principle. You're saying, God, this belongs to you. And then God trusts you with more. It's amazing, amazing how it works. So tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. Sec third thing, tithing must be first. Tithing must be first. I just kind of mentioned that. Exodus 23, 19 says, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord, your God. It's a first fruits principle. Uh, this is why you really see this throughout the Bible. Uh, but this is why uh, uh, you can go all the way back to the Exodus. And after they come out of bondage and they start taking over the promised land and and, uh, and they go into Jericho, the first uh, country they have to, the first city they have to conquer in the promised land. And, and God begins to say, all right, I want you to give the first fruit. And so when they went to Jericho and they didn't give all of the first fruits, back to the Lord, and they go to the next little city called Ai, like it's a little dinky city, like they used to be able to wipe it off the planet, you know, flick it like a booger. I don't know if I can say that in 8 o'clock service. <laughs> but they should just be able to wipe it right off the planet, you know. And they go there, and they lose a battle. And God says, the reason why you just lost this battle is because you weren't honest with me with the first fruit, the first portion in part of Jericho there. So uh, it's a first fruit. You see this throughout the Bible. That's why Matthew 6.33 says, 
But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. It's the first fruit thing. It can't be a second fruit. It can't be a third fruit. It's the first thing that should come out of your account once you've been paid or however that looks like for you. The first fruit thing. Uh, it all belongs to the Lord anyway, as we talked about last week, right? Uh, and since it all belongs to the Lord, sometimes we say things like we give the tithe. That's not actually grammatically correct. We don't give the tithe. We bring the tithe because you can't give somebody something that already belongs to them. You've heard me give this illustration many times. But if I give Tim my car keys and I say, listen, I'm going on vacation for a week. But while I'm gone, I want you to be able to drive my car anytime you want to. And I come back from vacation and Tim brings my car keys back to me. and He says, Pastor, I want to give you this car. I'm going to be like, Tim, you're nuts. It was my car in the first place. I just let you use it. When you truly understand that it all belongs to the Lord, you're not actually giving a tithe. You are bringing a tithe back, a first fruits offering. Uh, this is beyond any, any offerings that you give outside of that. This is just a tithe. The tithe is not legalism. Uh, the tithe is a kingdom principle. Uh, the tithe also only goes to the church, the storehouse. The tithe does not go anywhere else. Your offerings can go anywhere in the world if you want to send them. As I talked about last week, you can give to places all over and needy families and needy situations and all this. That is beautiful and that is wonderful. But the tithe should always go to the storehouse, to the church, not to another church that needs it more. Uh, I actually had to do this not too long ago. There was a guy and, and he moved away and went to another church and I had to call him on the phone because he was still tithing to our church even though he was going to another church because it was bigger than ours. And in his mind, he thought, well, what's the big deal? And I, as your pastor, said, listen, I don't want your tithe. This goes to your church, not our church. I appreciate that you love us. I appreciate that you care for us. But it is time to sever that and move on to your church. I'm not going to steal from God what belongs to his. Amen? And so the tithing is first. And then I want to conclude with this. Tithing is a benefit to you. Remember that verse I gave you to start with, the, the first verse, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats brim over with new wine. Here's the kingdom principle. If you surrender it to Christ, he blesses it. Whether that be your life, whether that be your material possessions, whether that be your relationship, whether that be your finances. When you truly surrender it to Christ, he blesses it. That's why so many of us have have testimony stories where, uh, like, like for, with me, for instance, and my wife, both of us, at the time when we decided we would surrender our love life to Christ, God brought us together. Isn't that funny how that works? When we really get serious and say, God, I'm tired of going on this website or that website or whatever, not that that's always wrong, but God, I surrender my love life to you. When you want me to have the right one, you will send me the right one. Whenever we really surrender it, all of a sudden then God blesses us with the right person. Whatever you surrender to the king, which was his anyway, but whatever you surrender to the king becomes blessed. And it works the same way in your finances. And we oftentimes have said things in the church like God uh, funds the church through the tithe. That's not exactly true, although there is some truth to it. That I believe that is God's design, but God can get money from anywhere he wants to get money from. Uh, I do believe that. But at the same time, while that may have some truth to it, God wants to bless you through the tithe. Uh, there, there's certain testimonies you hear over and over in the church. Those who are tithing are blessed, and those who are not tithing say, I can't afford to tithe. Those are two testimonies you hear throughout time. Um, I want to share one quick video uh, about this subject of giving, and uh, before we go on and, and wrap up the service and, and take up the offering here at the end and, and, and wrap it up. So go ahead and, and play this video, and we're going to wrap. Hi, my name is Bridget Mullen Sayers. This is Jacob and John, um, and Tim Sayers is my husband. And I have a story to tell you about how God blessed me. He blesses me continuously, but um, this particular story um, was awesome, I felt. Um, I've always been a tithe payer. I grew up in church. My parents taught me always to pay tithes. Progressively, I have um, paid tithes on my net. Now I pay tithes on my gross. But God dealt with my heart about 2010 to um, start giving more to missions. And so um, there was a visitor to the church I was going to at the time that had a, um, an Indian 
uh, home for uh, girls for schooling them, and uh, God dealt with me to um, support them. It was in the summertime, and as a teacher, we don't make a whole lot of money, and summer is very, very um, tight, and I wasn't sure that I should do it, and I prayed about it, and I said, Lord, how are you going to um, get me through the summer? I don't know, but I'm going to trust you and have faith, and so I pledged to give um, a monthly uh, support for one of the uh, ladies in the orphanage, or the young girls in the orphanage, and um, that uh, August. I was in a temporary position at Hillsborough Community College. In that, that August, the position became permanent, and I had to reapply for it um, and go through interview processes and everything. And as I did that, um, I, the dean came to me and said, we want you to revise your uh, resume because we know that you have more schooling on there than you're showing. And um, I said, okay. And so I ended up getting the job. My temp temporary position became permanent. And um, when that happened, the president of the campus called me in in August and said, um, we would like to give you 7% more than the salary that I was making the previous year. And he, um, he wanted to show all of the things that I had and, and give me 7% and, and all of that. And that was in August. And I pledged in July um, for the um, missionary thing. Later that month, in, um, after school had started, probably about September, I also um, was approached after I became permanent there um, by the assistant to the dean, and she wanted me to be a part of a grant program. And the grant program uh, was going to be for two years and paid an additional $5,000 for each year um, that I was a part of it. And so um, I believe that God intervened, and the summer was tight. It was really hard, but I kept to my pledge and um, trusted in the Lord, and he provided. He provides all the time. Um, I also like to um, encourage uh, everyone that um, I keep a blessing book. I've had it since John was born, before John was born, and I write down um, all the times that God has blessed me and blessed my family, and I um, and encourage you to uh, keep a blessing journal because it's really neat to look back on all the years and see what how God has intervened in our lives. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon. If this message today blessed you, please let us know. You can email your testimony to info at brandonag.org. If you would like to make a donation to our church, please visit our website at www.brandonag.org and click the online giving tab. You can also find directions, phone numbers, and general information about our church. God bless you.